just in. Breaking news from Stacking Benjamins. Hey, stackers, looking for the perfect holiday gift for that person that thinks they can't save? Well, guess what? We have a course that we just scrubbed off, made even more basement-y than before. It's called Save 50, and you'll find it at stackybenjamins.com forward slash save 50. How does it work? We teach you how to do what our business partner Kathleen did. She saved 50% of her income. If you haven't even thought about saving 10%, well, guess what? Maybe you'll get up to 30% or 40%. Not only does it come with modules that you do at your own pace, whenever you can finish them, it also includes our Save 50 Facebook group where you can help each other succeed at your goals. So if you're looking for a pack to hunt with and also for more savings in 2018, stackybenjamins.com forward slash save 50. Let's get to the show, OG. It's time to rock. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, holiday shoppers. We're gearing up for the holidays here by giving you the best gift of all. You in the driver's seat. That's because on today's show, we're answering your letters. Also, we'll cover some news on Green Monday and deliver some information on Bitcoin that you may not realize. And now two guys who haven't left the basement all day, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. And what a wonderful Monday it is. Hey, everybody, I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And just so you know which voice is which across this beautiful card table from me, it's the one and only other guy, as we call him, OG. We are closing in on the end of 2017. I can't believe how few days we have left in just, this year. It, there's so much to do, right? Didn't like, it, just, it doesn't matter how much you do the whole rest of the year. All crams into the last two weeks of the year. Didn't it just begin? I thought that I thought like it, I thought it just it. just begun. You don't think you want to get done though, OG? You want to look for a better way to invest, don't you? Yes, I do. And if so, you got to check out M1 Finance because they've completely rethought how online brokerages should work. That's my favorite part of M1. They make investing enjoyable, convenient, low cost. You build an investment portfolio by specifying what percentage of your money you want to go into certain investments. And by the way, if you're not sure, they have already pre-made and proven portfolios for you to use. It's that simple. M1 automates all the buying and selling to put your money into the portfolio with the correct allocation and even uses fractional shares so every penny gets put to work. And it intelligently adapts how it directs the money based on market movement. You know, the best thing to do during the holidays, give yourself the gift of an automatic investment plan. Because at M1, if you use the Stacky Benjamins code, it's free for the first year. How great is that? StackyBenjamins.com forward slash M, the number one finance, or download their slick mobile app on iOS or Android. M1 Finance, be invested. This show is also brought to you by you, because if you're a big fan of Stacky Benjamins, you want to help the show, and you're doing your holiday shopping on Amazon, OG, you know what you do? You head to StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Amazon, and you still get the same great Amazon deals, Amazon Prime, all the great Amazon stuff, but... You also help the Stacky Benjamins podcast when you do that because they send us a little thank you for referring you. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Amazon. All right. We got an Amazon of a show today, man. It's so huh? bad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we got awesome headlines. We've got your letters. Always my favorite show. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline today comes to us from The Balance. I didn't know anything about this, by the way, until... Uh, balance? Yeah, neither do I. Well, <laughs> I'll work, I'll play. I'm one or the other. <laughs> I don't know. That you're right. I don't know about that either. But I didn't know that today was a holiday called Green Monday. Have you heard of Green Monday? Uh, no. Shannon, our community manager, shared this with me. She's like, I've never heard of Green Monday. And apparently, this is a big deal. Didn't know. Okay. It's the second, according to The Balance... And Kimberly Amadeo, Kimberly Amadeo, isn't there a song that she had? Amadeo, Amadeo, 
Oh, my day, oh, my day, oh, my day. That's so, so bad. You're such a dork. I am such a... And you know what? The millennials have no idea what song I'm even referring to. <laughs> Green, Green Monday, what, when, where? This is the second best day for online holiday deals today. So if you missed out on Cyber Monday, OG, today apparently is the day. Green Monday is the second Monday in December, also known as Cyber Monday 2 because it's the second biggest day for online sh- holiday shopping. For that reason, Green Monday, promoted by top stores like Walmart, Target, and Amazon to extend the excitement around Cyber Week and the Black Friday kickoff. In 2016, Green Monday online retail sales were $1.621 billion. That beat the 2014 record of $1.615 billion. Only Cyber Monday has seen greater sales at $2.5 billion. Big deals today. So if you missed it, today might be the day. Today's another day you could slack off at work. But I still think this I, Amazon. this idea of uh, looking at deals, I mean, I love how guest after guest on the show is like, it's, you know, the holiday is not about spending more money. I love how we've already, we have already knowing that people aren't going to listen to our advice to spend a little less this year, stay in that, you know, green Monday could be leaving yourself in the green or in the black or whichever holiday Ooh, term you want to have. I like that. Yes. A little spin on the screw you walmart but we've, we, we've amazon <laughs> but if you do go to amazon go to stackingbenjamins.com slash amazon <laughs> but if you're don't the, do it but if you do if you're gonna be bad our link. take us take <laughs> us with you right you know it's funny though knowing that people aren't going to do that we've already got the start of next year hooked up with new year's day we're going to talk about getting your budget in order because you probably wrecked it this month. And then we're going to talk about a debt cleanse uh, on the 3rd of January. <laughs> like all the mistakes you make, we got you covered. Don't at the beginning. worry about it. We got you covered. We got you day. covered. But make all the mistakes you want. In fact, you have the greatest amount of gains when you come from the lowest points in your life. So just implode all of your finances over the next three weeks. You sound like a JV high school football coach. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, I know we got our butt kicked the first three quarters of this game, but if we can win the fourth quarter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. On that note, by the way, we have Green a Monday. We have a note here from the people at FICO. We have shut down your credit card account, Mr. OG. <laughs> no, not no, not that one. <laughs> That's a different one. We weren't talking about that one publicly, but hey, if you want oh. to. This is all about being safe during the holiday season. It says recent data breaches. Hey, did you know there were recent data breaches? Hadn't heard. What, what, what's a data breach? Apparently, FICO is telling me. By the way, FICO are the people that handle your credit score. Yeah, that recent mobile data number to give you crappy interest rates at the bank. <laughs> recent data breach. What? What? What happened? Have exposed millions more cardholders' details. The number of cards compromised U.S. ATMs and merchants rose thirty nine percent in the first six months of two thousand seventeen. Compared to the but same period in 2016. Because didn't we all get those fancy new credit cards that have the little chips in them? So those are like way more safe now. It should be way easier, way, way better, safer, shouldn't it? I guess not more safe. Than uh, FICO safe. offers these <laughs> tips, which I really like for days like today that are high spending days. Take care at ATMs. If an ATM looks odd or your card doesn't enter the machine smoothly, consider going somewhere else for Just your cash. Jam it in there. Just keep repeatedly doing it, going, I don't <laughs> understand. My pin is 1269. Just try harder, right? Number number two, never approach an ATM. Storm into the bank and get a whole bunch of cash out in a big envelope. That's right. even safer. Oh, always wear your ski mask when you go into the yes. bank. It's really cold. And wear gloves and a ski mask and a big coat. And leave your hands in your pockets. Right. <laughs> Yell really loud. I'm here to take some money out of the bank. Please. Please. <laughs> And they like you better. Car if running at the front entrance <laughs> with the door open, preferably with someone else driving. And the bank always likes you better if you never look anybody in the eye and you're shaking a little bit. Exactly. Got a hat to cover your eyes. Don't ever look at any of those cameras. Please, and wait. please don't follow any of that. Please, we're joking. We are. We are joking. I'm not. I would love to see. No, somebody. you're totally joking. Uh, never approach an ATM if anyone's lingering nearby. Never engage in conversations with others around ATM. I mean, hey man, what's up? <laughs> hey, hey, uh, <laughs> here you come here often. My pin doesn't seem to be working. You want to put this in for me? Why don't you hey, give uh, this a shot? Can uh, can I use your card? My car's not working. Remain in your automobile until other ATM users have left the ATM. If your plastic card's captured inside of an ATM, call your card issuer immediately to report it. Some out of the ATM. 
What's that? Get it out. I said, beat the hell out of it to get it back. <laughs> you're Especially right. if it's like a Saturday at two in the afternoon. You're like, I've got shopping to do. You're, you're on fire. Yeah, these are important, though. Seriously, you've seen some horrible things happen at ATM machines, and you just you want to be careful. Also, check your purchases. Check your card transactions frequently using online banking in your monthly statement. I use an app. I use the person. I use the Clarity app. We have no affiliation with Clarity, by the way. But uh, use an app to review You're happy to. everything. Work with your card issuer. Ask your card issuer for a new card number if you suspect your payment card may have been compromised. It's important to change both your card number and your PIN whenever you experience a potential theft of your personal information and ask your card provider if they offer account alert technology that will deliver SMS, text communications, or emails to you in the event that fraudulent activity is suspected. I like that. I have that on my cards and I like it in the, nope, that was me. Good stuff here from FICO. The second headline comes to us from the street. Warning is by Tanzil Akdar. Warning. Bitcoin profits are considered taxable income by the IRS as the IRS and other tax authorities scrutinize cryptocurrency transactions like never before. It's important to know how investors should manage and track their tax liability. It might not be welcome news, but Bitcoin profits are taxable in many places around the world. And those profits have been plentiful with its price increasing more than 10 times since the beginning of the year. Back, Back in August, the street warned of heightened probes into cryptocurrency tax evasion and the importance of Bitcoin investors declaring profits. Cryptocurrencies are under scrutiny like never before. The IRS recently won a lawsuit against Coinbase, one of the largest Bitcoin wallet and exchanges, requiring it to hand over records relating to users who conducted Bitcoin trades worth more than $20,000. Trades worth more than $20,000. We're going to see much bigger trades than that now. This is the tip of the iceberg, OG, as Bitcoin has made uh, money hand over fist. You're going to see people go, I didn't know that was... Taxable. Well, I read. I read this news. I don't know if it was a similar article or not. And the IRS a year ago was investigating this company Coinbase and wanted all the records because something like twenty thousand people, two hundred thousand, some big number, right? Some some large number of people use Coinbase or you know something similar. Yet only like. 400 people reported gains on their tax returns right. from Bitcoin. And the IRS is like, wait a second. Where's all the money for all these people that have <laughs> this, basically it's this stock that went up a whole bunch, right? Or it's, a, you know, it's this, this trading thing. So this is the Bitcoin issue. I think you have people investing in Bitcoin that have no idea like how taxes work, how investments work. I mean, it, it's it's funny because well, this is one hundred percent speculation. It's it, the hail mary. It pass. is it is totally the hail mary pass, and yep. and not that. And please don't send me letters saying I don't get Bitcoin. We can go over that again for the fifty seven bajillionth time. I get Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. OG, if you're using it as an investment, even though it's through the roof, like what data do you have besides the fact that everybody's doing it? I mean, there's, there is, it's yeah. tough to have data around Bitcoin. Well, it's brand new. And, and I get the whole idea of supply and demand and that sort of thing. And eventually there'll be, you know, no more supply and but tons in that of demand. Way, but in that way, it ends up being, in, in that way, it's similar to gold. Like, you know, gold, really no manufacturing usage. It's just supply and demand. And as more people think that gold's valuable, gold goes up in value. But that's the problem. And, and how do you gauge that? How do you judge it? Like I get it as a, as a currency, as an investment, I don't, I don't get it. Another thing about it is a currency right now, if I'm buying it as a currency, do I want a currency that's gone up 10 times in one year? Like, my, like if I'm not sure what the price of my sandwich is going to be tomorrow using this versus a dollar. So the future, yeah, okay, I get it. Investment, I don't get it. Currency, I don't get it. Great to receive it, right I suppose. Now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe not so great to be spending it. Yeah, if you want to give us some Bitcoin, uh, Stacky Be- Joe at StackyBenjamins.com. Yeah, I'll take some too. Feel free to throw some our way. But there will be taxes at the end of the day. No on, problem. I'm happy to pay taxes. On and, and it's a great dollars. time, not just on Bitcoin, but it's a great time to think about your tax bill overall, OG, right now, before the end of the year. Well, you know, we talk about capital loss harvesting and that sort of thing. Really not been a lot of that this year. Maybe you've got some leftover losses from 2015. The market was pretty flat then, but it's unlikely that that's, uh, that that's a whole bunch left over. So this might be a uh, capital gain year. And then we got all the mutual fund distributions of capital gains coming. If you haven't, haven't got those yet, that's uh, 
that's going to be a little bit of a surprise also, I think, to a lot of people. Those are my favorite. When you get capital gains and you haven't sold anything. Yeah. You're like, what? I didn't sell anything. Those were always the best calls when I was a financial planner. I, we didn't sell anything and I got this tax bill. Explain yeah. how that works for people that don't know. Well, mutual funds and ETFs are not taxable entities. So the the tax associated with the buying and selling of the positions within there gets passed on to the shareholders based on how many shares you own of the fund, basically. So, you know, Joe Blow fund manager has a thousand shares of Apple and he sells it and realizes a million dollar profit. Um, that million dollar profit, somebody's got to pay taxes on that. Even even if you personally as a shareholder of the fund never sold anything, that's going to get passed on. And they tried to do a good job of offsetting those with with losses, you know, if they have those in the portfolio as well. But um, in a year like this year, my guess is that there's going to be some pretty pretty healthy gains. Yeah, it's and the reason why you don't see this with exchange traded funds as much as with mutual funds is exchange traded funds because they're on the exchange have this share swapping mechanism that they use that avoids a lot of those legally avoids a lot of those capital gains taxes mm -hmm. that mutual funds end up getting. Oh man, I think the lessons today though, selling bitcoin, make sure to make sure the IRS knows so you don't get an unfortunate letter knock on your door later on and then number two lesson maybe the bigger lesson stay safe as you're celebrating this little holiday apparently called green monday that none of us really know about well you ready to dig in og i didn't know if i was ready to dig in or begin couldn't tell which. We're going to have some fun today because we have a big backup on the voicemail side of things. So we are going to jump on the Haven Lifeline early. We'll talk about them later on, but uh, let's get to it. We're going to start off with this call for help from our new friend, Genevieve. Say hi, Genevieve. Hi, Joe. Hi, OG. I haven't been watching your show for the past so many days. And I was wondering, I don't know if you've already covered this topic, but when it comes to bonds, is it smarter to buy uh, 25 increments, like uh, a $25 bond every month? Or is it smarter to, once a year, invest in a $300 bond? Uh, what I've been looking into has been government bonds. But if this works for other kinds of bonds, then that works too. I'm just starting to get into investing, so I don't know much. Any advice helps. Thanks. Hey, Genevieve. Genevieve is new to the show. Cool. So welcome to the show, Genevieve. And the first Binge thing, listening. That's scary. Yeah. And the first thing you're going to know, it won't know yet, uh, but you're going to know here in the next uh, 20 seconds, is that, <laughs> is that OG's not a big fan of that strategy at all. Uh, but let's say that for whatever reason, Genevieve has to buy bonds. Better to break up those sales if she's buying individual government bonds, or is it better to buy them all at once? I guess she's probably talking about uh, savings bonds, maybe, or a bond fund. I mean, she could I be guess, buying individual treasuries, but not in twenty-five dollar increments. Not in twenty-five dollar increments, yeah. So maybe we're buying a bond fund. I'll answer it two ways. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Genevieve. <laughs> I don't even know why you'd be buying bonds. But anyways, there's my anti-bond rant. Well, <laughs> I was gonna say for the show, but we don't know what's coming, so maybe. Not sure what's going to come out of your mouth yeah, later. I don't know what's. It's all live television here, folks. <laughs> so savings bonds, you can buy my Treasury Direct, a bond mutual fund. You know, there's thousands of those. If you have the ability to systematically invest over a long period of time, I like the idea of the monthly habit of twenty five dollars. Arguably, you could look at it and say but shouldn't I put all of my money in up front if I could do that? Well, yeah, sure. If you can do 300 a month, do 300 a month, right? What I would do is I would start with whatever you can do on a monthly basis and work to increase that over time, whether it's stocks or bonds or whatever, it doesn't matter. Work to increase, you know, if it's $25 a month right now, in two months from now, see if you can do $30 a month. And in two months after that, see if you can do $35 a month and just continually increase that systematic savings because eventually it'll get to the point where you can do 300 a month or 500 a month or whatever, you know, and then you'll look back and say, well, geez, I was thinking about trying to invest $300 a year and I'm doing it monthly. So regardless of bonds or mutual funds or stocks or whatever, 
the most important thing is to make it a systematic habit because that'll get you further down the line and instill that kind of discipline when things aren't going so well, kind of always pay yourself first. It just builds that good muscle. You know, I like about your strategy too, is that often with new investors like Genevieve, buying a bond fund allows people to look at one of the two ways that you make money. You make money on the position going up or down. And a lot of times, OG, that makes people think it's magic, right? And then they think that financial advisors know what's going to happen in the future. Like, is this going to go up or is it going to go down? And there's plenty of financial people that are willing to play that game, which is, I think, a mistake for everybody. It's a mistake to ask, and it's a mistake for the advisor to answer where they think it's going. But the other way, the more secure way, is through these interest payments or dividend payments and watching those reinvest. So what I would do sometimes with new investors that were really worried about how things worked and wanted to see it in action, we'd invest some money in a bond fund, and then we'd reinvest the dividend. And of course, what would that do with the next dividend, OG? It'd make it bigger. It's and then the they'd, have, bigger. Yep. they'd have bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'd say, guess what? At some point, this is going to get big enough that you can live on part of this and you'll stop reinvesting it. And then you can take it. Now, when you start taking that payout, that's going to stunt the growth of your fund. So your ability to fight inflation is going to go bye-bye. But when this number gets big enough, just conceptually, I think that really helped people see how there's there's two ways to make money. You can put money in and your money can put money in. And it really makes you fired up when you see your money putting more money in on your behalf. That really gets people excited. The bad news about that, every time you reinvest those dividends, we talked about taxes earlier. If it's not in a tax shelter, that's a tax hit. But that's a little bit of the price of education, I think. Genevieve, we talked a little bit about questioning that strategy if you're a new investor, maybe a diversified portfolio, I think, is a better way to go. It all depends on what your time frame is, and you didn't ask that in your question or mention what your time frame was in your question. But a government bond fund for something that's a long-term goal, really, it's going to have trouble keeping up with, well, it might just barely keep up with that inflation monster, OG. Well, and that's really answering the question that wasn't asked, which is, you know, is it better to have a bond fund or a stock mutual fund or something like that? And like you said, maybe there's a reason she's doing the fixed income. But um, personally, I don't think that you want to use a lot of fixed income in your accounts, hardly ever, for a lot of reasons. Number one, interest rates are really low. But just the just the long-term appreciation potential of a well-diversified stock portfolio just beats the heck out of a bond portfolio. So I don't know why you would. Yeah, open up you know, an M1 finance account, some other an account someplace else, uh, keep the fees low and have a diversified portfolio. And you're, I think, usually better served. Our next question comes to us from Kevin. Say hello, Kevin. Hey, Joe and OG, this is Kevin. Uh, you guys have previously talked about working backwards to determine the amount of money that you have to save for retirement. Can you guys go into some details about exactly how to figure out that amount? I was a little fuzzy on that calculation. Maybe I'll book the trend and learn something. Heck, who am I kidding? Thanks, guys. Don't do that. You don't Please wanna, don't. Don't want to book that trend, Kevin. No, no. Thanks. A little scratchy there, but I think we got the question. So, uh, Yeah, the question was, how do you figure out how much you need in retirement? You know, back of the envelope calculation. Here's how I do it. You look like you're going to say something you want me to run through. Well, I just want to say that uh, for, between the time that Kevin asked that question and today, we had Roger Whitney on last Wednesday who went over his his pasta dish style. And I think if he goes and listens to that interview from last Wednesday, he'll get a nice start. But I, I'm fairly certain you're going very similar direction. Well, maybe. Here's how I work backward from the number. The first thing that you want to do is figure out what your lifestyle expenses are now. So let's say that you spend $5,000 a month today. You're 40 years old. So now we have to add inflation to that 5,000 bucks, right? And you want to retire when you're 60. So I'm going to add inflation over 20 years on five grand. So that makes it $9,000 20 years from now, right? So that's how much I need month one, year one of retirement, okay? Multiply by 12, 108,000. So maybe I'll round and say 100,000, easy enough, or 110. So we'll do 100,000. And now I'll just divide that by 4.5%. Gives me 2.5 million, 2 and a quarter million, somewhere in there. That's my target. Now, there's way more, you could get way more in the weeds than yes, that. And yeah. trust me, you have to, to do a really well done, you know, retirement income plan. But just to kind of ballpark, throw a dart at a dartboard and say how much, you know, what's my target? That's how I would do it. I would just take your living expenses today, add inflation to it over the next dumpty frats years until you want to retire. 
multiply it by 12 and then divide by 4%, 4.5%, somewhere in there. And got your and starting end point up with uh, a ballpark anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the only thing Roger added to that was, of course, you're taking the number that you've got today. And he says, then, of course, and, and this is to your point of it gets more in the weeds. Part of those weeds are what's the basic cost to turn the lights on? You yeah. calculate that number. Then to do your, you know, the fun stuff is sauce. Uh, what are the fun things you want to do that you're not doing today? Or maybe you want to continue doing today, but it's not necessary to keep the lights on. And then what's that huge, those huge things that you just don't have any time for, don't have the money for, don't have the resource for, what's that number? And then back that yep. down to today. And and based on, you know, because there's three parts of this calculation for people that don't know what Kevin's talking about. The very simple calculation is amount of money you need to save times a rate of return equals that goal. So once what Kevin's referring to is the goal, starting with the goal and then working that equation backwards. So now that I know that it's to your point, two and a half million dollars, let's say, mm -hmm. now I look at just two variables that I start switching out. If I save X amount per month and I get Y return, what, where does, does that get me my two and a half million? And if it doesn't, then I need to change one of those two variables, right? I either need to save more money or I need to change the rate of return assumption. And the more I make the rate of return aggressive, the more I, let's say, instead of 8%, I go to 9, 10, 11, the, the riskier that portfolio gets and the bigger chance of not, not meeting it. What's the biggest number you'd go to on a, I'll just keep on getting more aggressive. Let me tell you this. I'm not going to 12. Not 12. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going, not going to 12. Sorry, Mr. Dave Ramsey, I'm not going near. <laughs> oh, that's that, that was that, that was the dig a day. Okay. I see it now. I didn't, I didn't see that. I set that up, but I can, I can now, now tell that I put that right on. It's like a wiffle ball right on that little tee and you just hit it out of the ball. You, you totally teed that. I was talking to somebody today. Somebody walked into, uh, another friend's office, apparently, uh, Niall from financial time traveler and said that somebody walked into his office and wanted to know that 12% per year fund that Dave Ramsey's referencing and wanted the ticker symbol. Yeah. It's, uh, ABCFU. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's not, I, that, I hope that's not a real thing. <laughs> I hope not either. Cause, cause that was a joke peeps. Yes, sure was. Yeah. But yeah. So you don't want to say, well, I'll just grow my money at 22%. Uh, then I'll have to save $300 a month and I'm there. Bada boom, bada bing. Cause that ain't gonna happen. Um, yeah. 10, 10% 10 fine. 11. Oh, boy. boy. That's mm doable, but you got to realize what you're doing to yourself when you put those other numbers in there, right? When you say, oh, I'll just get 11%. Great. There are, there are portfolios you can design that generate 11% return, right? With asset classes. It also generates a minus 60% return every so often. And so what are you going to do if you have the minus 60? You got to know what you're getting yourself into when you pick up one end of that stick. So. I think I'd only do 10%. Uh, that would be about, that's pretty much as high as I want to go to. I like nine, I like eight, yeah. seven and a half makes me yeah. real comfortable. Well, and the reason Six it makes three quarters, <laughs> the, the reason it makes us comfortable isn't because, you know, but because we don't know investing, it's because the one piece of the equation that's easier to control is you putting money in. So if, if we aim at 10, but we know we only need six and a half, how great is that? Because then everything works out much better. You can tell the man to go away quicker, or you yep. can live on more money. You have more flexibility to do what you want. You can take a sabbatical, do whatever you want. If you keep that investment return side expectation low, but to finish that sentence, cause I didn't finish that sentence. So gee, I think it only go 10. If somebody has got 20 years or longer, like if you've got less than 20 years, I think it's pretty dangerous to even go 10. Yeah, I agree. So good stuff. Thanks for the question there, Kevin. Our next question comes to us from Rob. Say hi, Rob. I've over-contributed to my 401k for this year by about 1000 with approximately five paychecks left in the calendar year. I was able to do this because my 401k provider changed and the old one didn't tell the new one how much I'd already contributed. Don't. My company matches half a percent up to 6% on pre-tax contributions only. As such, I've adjusted my contribution to be 6% with a reset to hit next year's max on the first of the year. What happens now that I've over-contributed, is it like when I over-contributed to my HSA, I just fill out a form that says my overage is next year's, or is it more complicated? Thanks, and I promise I won't learn anything. Excellent. Good stuff there, Rob. So, mm -mm. 
one 401k provider didn't talk to the new one. I didn't know that you could punt on that for the HSA either. That would be fantastic. That certainly is the the the, the easiest solution if you can say, yeah, sorry, I put too much money in. Um, put it on next year's. The problem I I think you're going to run into is I don't think the government's going to sign off on that. I don't think the IRS is going to do that because couldn't I then just say, oh, shucks, I put in 20 years, let's Duh. say I got, you know, $300,000, right? I put in 20 years of extra contributions by accident. Um, just roll it to next year. And then I get all the benefit of the tax deferral for 20 years. Right. Well, right. It, and, and market returns because, you know, most of the time the market goes up. So if I can put it in sooner, I want to do that. Yeah. So I think you're going to find that the uh, 401k provider will have to uh, refund it to you. Uh, little taxes do. So you'll get taxed on the gain, whatever amount that that extra thousand grew to between when you put it in and when you take it out. But I would not wait on this. I don't want this to linger into 2018. I want my tax return numbers to be right. <laughs> what my W-2 and all that sort of stuff. So get with the 401, current 401k provider as soon as you can and say, hey, I calculated I put too much money in. How do I get the extra amount out and uh, let them work through it? They're the record keepers and the fiduciaries for it. So they have to provide you with a solution. Otherwise, they get in hot water. So don't drag it out. Try to get it done before the first of the year because um, it'll be a little messier on your taxes if you wait until after 2018. Yeah, good question there. I think this is also a case where you work with your HR. Yeah, because sure. because really, if it's old four hundred one size of the company, if if it's old four hundred one k provider, new four hundred one k provider, really, Rob, the problem's not yours. I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the buck stops no, no, with the you because it's your four hundred one k. What's that? I said the problem is definitely his. Well, according to the IRS, but he didn't create this over contribution issue. Doesn't matter. What does the IRS care? I think I'd involve your HR department as much as possible. I would complain unless the HR department is really small, you know, if you're a small firm or something, I'd still then I wouldn't. I'd still complain. Of course you would. I complain about this podcast. Squeaky wheel, squeaky wheel. <laughs> That's I right. demand justice for the $22 of income that my thousand bucks made in the last week. We've got uh, more of your letters, including the one we're going to dub the Haven Lifeline call. But uh, right now, OG, I think it's time to stretch our legs. And uh, I need Doug, some more coffee. Yeah, Doug, what you got for trivia? Hey there, trivia fans. Let's take a break from cleaning your financial house for a housing-based trivia challenge. See what I see what I did there. I. I know, you know, maybe I shouldn't point it out all the time, but honestly, just don't know how many folks out there are on the same genius level I am to realize when I do that. All right, anywho, here's the question. The Roofstock team tells us that this time of year is the best time to get a deal on a house. But here's the question. Which room are people most interested in when buying a home? I'll have your answer in just a moment. talked about this stat before, but this is scary. According to a 2016 Gallup poll, 48% of all Americans don't own any stock. And I realize it can be dawning when it's time to start something new, but here's a great thing. Getting invested is more to do with taking baby steps than leaping headfirst into Wall Street. Here's Brian Barnes, founder of M1 Finance, on just how easy it is to be invested. So you just either log on to the website or use the mobile application. We're native on Android and iOS, and it takes about three minutes, and your first $1,000 that you deposit is managed for free. I'd love to say the free $1,000 is a special deal I made for you, but uh, Brian and M1 Finance are that good to everybody. With M1, you can select from one of dozens of professionally designed portfolio pies, or you can customize it, as mom says, to your heart's content. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash M1 Finance for more. That's stackybenjamins.com. M, the number one, finance.com for more. So just fire up their mobile app, M1 Finance, be invested. Welcome back, trivia fans. Before the break, I asked you this question. Which room are people most interested in when buying a home? If you said the kitchen, you'd be right. Makes sense, right? Who doesn't spend most of their time in the kitchen? Between breakfast, second breakfast, brunch, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, dessert, late dinner, third dinner, the time really does start to add up. 
Now I'm getting a little hungry. Excuse me while I go find some beef jerky. See ya. Nice job on that. Drop the mic. Winner, winner. Chicken. Steak, dinner. <laughs> I like how you upgraded that. Nice. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's, or rather, life insurance's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry, OG, by focusing on those two things you value most. Steak and all ground potatoes, obviously. Cha. Or your family and your time. But if you can have family and time with steak and all gratin potatoes, even better. Yes, I'll take the steak every time. They were the first life insurance startup, also wholly owned by industry giant Mass Mutual, to create a high quality, affordable term life insurance policy you can purchase entirely online. And qualified healthy applicants, well, guess what? You can skip the medical exam. If you're not qualified and not healthy, you can skip to the medical exam. <laughs> Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and learn about life insurance a modern way. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And our Haven Lifeline call today comes to us from a new friend, Leo. Say hello, Leo. Hello, OG and Joe. I've listened to a few handfuls of your episodes and think that you guys are hilarious, but I've learned nothing. I don't know which one of you guys I like the most, so I have two similar questions for both of you to answer. Whoever has the better answer becomes my favorite. Number one, how do you determine your risk level? My wife and I are a few years shy of 30 years old and have one mortgage loan with no other debt. No kids, but we have a 20 pound chihuahua mix. Number two, it's a similar question because it was also about finance. If I can afford a cheap rental property without taking any loans, should I pay 100% of the property or put 20% down to avoid PMI and invest the rest? Or should I just not have a rental property and invest at all? Thank you, guys. First of all, Leo, I don't have any interest in being your friend. So. Oh, well, in that case, winner by <laughs> default, default. I'm not playing your game. There's no then I win. <laughs> that is so funny. That's well, funny. an OG needs a friend, Leo. So uh, you oh, and you and OG go off into the sunset. Go have steak and gratin potatoes together. Mm. There you go. That's fantastic. Oh, Actually, these are some great questions, mm -hmm. Leo. So let's uh, let's kick this off with risk tolerance. How do you how do you determine the right level of risk? So in my business, I approach this question a little bit differently than I think most financial professionals do. I want to approach it from the perspective of I want to tell my money what to do. So I know how much I need to save. I know how much my goal is. I know how long I have time frame. Now I need to tell the money how much I want it to grow at. We talked about within reason, of course, I can't have my money grow at 20%, but then I'm going to look at that rate of return that my money has to grow to help me reach my goals. Then I'm going to say, am I okay with the volatility that this level of portfolio return produces? And so run some statistical analysis on what the uh, ups and downs are going to look like and then say, OK, if that happens, what am I likely to do? Right. If the worst case happens, the market goes down and I go down with it. I'm down 30 percent. I had 100 grand today. I have 70. Do I smile and wave and keep going or, do, or am I really concerned about it? I'm going to make a change to the portfolio? Because the single greatest determinant to long term investor results is investor behavior. So if I'm going to bail from the plan when it goes down 30%, I have to put a plan in place that doesn't go down 30 or at least has a high likelihood of not going down 30 and then adjust the goals from there. So risk tolerance for me isn't so much about, you know, how many cups of sugar do I like in my, you know, pantry before I get concerned. You know, they've got these weird risk tolerance questionnaires that, that people send out. To me, it's about what level of volatility can I stomach to achieve the, the stated level of return that I need to well, help me reach my goals. What, what level do I need to take? And then, yeah, and then can it. I handle it? Absolutely. Do not waste time with these uh, silly risk tolerance quizzes because what I see is- You are moderate aggressive. Yeah, what the hell does that mean? I know. And I'll ask people, well, back, back when I was an advisor, I'd ask people, so how did you pick your investments? Well, I took a risk tolerance quiz. Well, where is that going to get you? And to the question that earlier about where do we start, you know, uh, how do we determine the end number? Well, that's going to produce the rate of return that we need. And so when people would say, well, I'm moderately aggressive. All right, well, where's that going to get you? I don't know. So why do, do we need to take that much risk? What if we could get there and take less risk? Would you take less risk? 
Or would you save more money, maybe push up that date that you're financially independent? Well, yeah, I don't mind the risk of my investments. Or, yeah, you know, I really don't like the ups and downs. I mean, that's going to create a whole different scenario. So it's annoying that you stole my answer. You looked at my notes across the table. I don't think that's fair. But Should we say great minds think alike? Well, I mean, a great mind thinks great things, and the other guy steals the stuff and talks first. So we can say that. Huh. That's, that's probably better. Considering you're always the first to talk on a podcast. I take that as a compliment. I always let you answer the question first. And when I don't, you get surly, uh, like you're getting surly now. So uh, second, though, what about the rental house question? Does he, if he's got cash to put down on a rental house and he can uh, afford to do it just with cash, does he take out a loan? Or does he avoid- Far be it from me to answer first. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> no, no, no. After you. I wouldn't want to break protocol. Age before beauty? Anyways, uh, no, I wouldn't pay cash for the house. The whole idea of rental property is that uh, you're leveraging other people's money along the way, right? So I, would, uh, I wouldn't put 20% down. I may put 30 or 40% down because you want to take a look at, again, this is the calculation going beginning with the end in mind here. How much is the rent going to be on the place that I'm going to buy? Got to add my vacancy factors and maintenance and upkeep and that sort of stuff to it. And then juxtapose that against what the mortgage payment would look like. And, uh, you know, get to a happy medium on the down payment that that builds all those kind of negative factors in there so that I'm cash flow even or maybe slightly positive. That's that's how I would approach it. Yeah. But uh, and by the way, uh, Roofstock, uh, if that's what he's talking about is going through Roofstock, they have those calculators to do all those things. OG, as you well, you know, I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, they have those calculators right there with all the properties. So as you're evaluating properties, you can kind of manipulate some of those numbers. You know, I would start off, uh, Leo, because you said, or should I skip real estate altogether? I'll tell you, being an active real estate investor, you, you want to make sure that you're the right type of person for that. I mean, certainly there are companies like Roofstock where you can be completely hands off. But if you intend on being hands on, I found, OG, that that only works with specific people. So I like the idea of starting small. And uh, buying one house and seeing, you know, do I really like this way of making money versus more, I guess, passive ways uh, Mm -hmm. of making money? And if so, if you like real estate but want it to be more passive, a company like Roofstock's the way to go. But leverage versus not leverage. I'll tell you, I also think, and tell me what you think about this. I think it's also about education, how much you know about leverage. Because I think it's important to get a healthy respect for the dollar first. And to live your life as unleveraged. Because I find that, generally speaking, people deploy leverage when they don't know how dangerous it can be. (laughs) And when they do that, I think they run into some problems sometimes where more experienced investors deploy leverage really, really well. Like companies use leverage all the time. But you've got a CFO who's highly skilled and trained in finance knows the danger of taking that leverage ahead of time versus "Mm, I can't pay my credit card bill this month. Maybe I'll uh, just take out a loan to pay that off. Okay. What's your strategy to pay off that loan? I don't know. I just got to get rid of interest. Yeah. For six months. All right. What's your strategy after six months? Boy, hadn't thought that far ahead. Well, when a, when a CFO of a company and really you're the CFO of your company, right? Your company, your, your family uh, takes out a loan. They make sure that they've got a strategy to get all that, uh, to get that taken care of. So I would say, Leo, it has as much to do with you as anybody else. If you're somebody who already has that healthy respect for a dollar, you can put a plan together, certainly use somebody else's money to do that. But if not, if you're already struggling with debt in other places of your financial plan, I wouldn't add more leverage to this situation. I guess we'll see who he likes better. Well, seeing that my answer, our answer is kind of dovetailed. Uh, See, I said I wasn't going to play this game, and we're already Mm -hmm. playing the game. Thanks, Leo, for the question. That was awesome. Uh, We also get letters. This letter comes to us from our good friend Dylan. Well, our new good friend Dylan. Dylan says, hey, Joe and OG, I've been listening to your show for about a week now, but you guys helped me build some great enthusiasm about investing in my financial future. I'm only 25, so time's on my side. And after hearing the episode, the number one key to get someone excited about saving money with Gene Natale, I'm almost giddy about getting started. That was a good episode, by the way. We'll we'll link to that episode. I love the fact that Gene, just to give people a little taste of what Gene talks about, Gene works with young people on helping them save. And he said that getting people afraid 
right, of the future. And don't get into debt, don't get into debt, don't get into debt, doesn't do anything. Getting them excited about how quickly your money compounds and starting a Roth IRA early, he said in his experience, working with students and teaching them about compounding interest and what happens if you start in a Roth IRA when you're 18, like what does that look like? And it's holy cow, it looks great. That's the, one of the keys to success. So he said, currently, we have about eight months of living expenses saved. I'm about to finish school, which comes with some student loans, unfortunately, and we own our home. Beyond those two big debts, house has about $120,000 left, and my loans total about 18000 Our total debts only add up to about 2000 Our goal is to have those, I think there's four accounts wrapped up in that number, debts paid off by February of next year, with only one actually being left by then and our tax return clearing that debt away. Unfortunately, me working introduces a new monthly bill of child care at about $1,500 a month, leaving only a gain of $500-ish a month from me going to work. The job I was just offered is a 3% simple IRA match program, so I'll take advantage of that free money. Much of that 500 is free to invest as my wife's income more than covers our living expenses. I want to invest beyond that simple IRA, but I haven't a clue where to start. Could you guys please give me some direction? Dylan, great question. I love these I've got a lot of opportunities here. What do I do? First of all, Dylan, congratulations on getting done with school. That's a major accomplishment and um, not one without a lot of sacrifice, I know. If you're already accustomed to living on one income, this is really great news because you can work to pay off that student loan debt uh, really quickly. So order one would be to take full advantage of the match, so 3% into the simple to get the 3% match. And if you're not using the other money for living expenses, I would be dumping all of that on the student loans and see if I can't get those knocked down really, really, really quickly. You mentioned February of next year. I think you mean February of 2019 maybe. But, uh, but I would see about getting it done even sooner. Secondly, I would look at, you know, continually look to upgrade your career. We talk a lot about saving money and we talk about investing money. But one of the best ways to make money is just to make more money, right? So if you're, if you're clearing five, $600 a month after writing a check for childcare for 1500 bucks, you know, always keep your ear to the ground and work on networking to kind of increase your, your uh, marketability, so to speak in the job market. Once you get done with paying off the student loans, I think the next order of business is, is making sure wife's got her 401k up to the company match. And assuming that's the case, then I'm going to go Roth IRAs for both of you, uh, max those out that, that that's another 11,000 dollars and then uh and then after that then i'm gonna go back to the 401ks and the simple iras to max those all out um and then after that uh take those two and then call me in the morning <laughs> my favorite my favorite book on networking like i always thought networking was you know it was it was okay it was a necessary evil but once i read this great book by keith ferrazzi called never eat alone I got it and it became much more fun. So if you uh if you're looking for Do not listen to that book on audiobook though. Why not? Oh my gosh. So it, boring. The guy talks. Are you kidding me? Like this. Oh, that's horrible. And after listening to you talk about the book, I'm like, this is gonna be a great book. And I I got it on books that tape. It's like it's like a seven hour long book. Oh. I could only imagine it was like seven thousand pages, and when I got the got the actual book, it's you know whatever it is, a yeah. Hundred, you know, the chapters are short. It's well written. It's fun. I, yeah, I, this I, book is terrible to listen to on Audible. Do not do uh, that. Sorry, Audible, if you're did, thinking about sending us some sponsorship money, but that is not my recommendation. Did you uh, see the photo of the dude reading "Never Eat Alone" while he's eating alone? No, but that's funny. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's like I always say, I always manage to get through the first. There's a number of books that I read every year, right? You know, you just kind of try to read them. And uh, one of my favorite things is to read the first chapter of Execution. <laughs> <laughs> it just stopped right there. It's that's exhausting. As as it's as far as I get. I do like that book, though. Hey, uh, thanks for your questions, and uh, that's going to wrap up today's show. If you've got questions for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com, and you'll see right on the top, it says questions for the show, question mark, click that link, and you know what? You'll see the Haven Lifeline there. You'll also see the place to send us a letter down here in the basement. Also, if you're looking at a way to kick off 2018 on a better foot than you had in 2017, OG's taking clients. So if you think you need good help in your corner, stackyvegements.com forward slash letter O, letter G to get on his calendar and find out what that will take. Uh, coming up on Wednesday, fantastic show. I have this love-hate 
uh, feeling about Wednesday's show, OG, because Taylor Schulte, CFP and host of the Stay Wealthy San Diego podcast, which is a great name. Stay Wealthy. Yeah, I love San, it. Stay Wealthy I San love Diego. It. Yeah. Taylor has this horror story about the home that he purchased and is a financial planner. He's got some great tips, number one, on what to do when you're buying a home, but also some good just general financial planning tips he got from this whole process. It's some ugliness involving having to sue the builder. And I'm just going to end there. Um, Just an ugly, ugly story, but also a a story that'll be very helpful for you on Wednesday. All right. We'll see you back then. Go stack some Benjamins. Doug, take it from here, big guy. So what craziness did we have on today's show that actually makes sense to remember? First, scoring some deals on Green Monday. Remember those tips straight from FICO. Be vigilant around ATM machines and review your transactions with your bank or budgeting app regularly. Second, planning for the future and wondering what risks you should take? Don't start with a risk tolerance quiz. Do some quick math to find out how much risk you need to take by checking out investments that historically have achieved your goals. And then ask yourself if that works or maybe you should back down the heat and save some more money instead. But the big lesson... If your name's Leo and you're writing a letter to Joe and OG asking them to compete, why don't you include the real expert around here? Clearly, Leo doesn't want the best answer. If he's only asking Joe and OG, I'll provide the real answer, Leo, for a small fee. And maybe you're buying the first two stuffed mushroom appetizers next time we're hanging out at the Sizzler together. Huge thanks to you for sending in your letters. Good news, people. That pretty much cleared the deck. Want Joe and OG to answer your question? Head to stackingbenjamins.com and you'll see the question for the show tab. If you aren't sure what to do after that, well, maybe the internet ain't for you. Try croquet or maybe some badminton or something really simple. When you're done messing around with us, who do you want to teach you some money tricks? That nerd who talks over your head or your favorite basement-based geeks? Kathleen Selmans operates our Stacking Benjamins classroom. And to make up for the fact that we don't teach you anything here on the show, she's created a whole lot of tools you'll absolutely love. Head to learn.stackingbenjamins.com for details. And use coupon code DOUGROCKS for 10% off. Yeah, you're welcome. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Special thanks to Dave Ramsey for dropping by the basement. Unfortunately, we ran out of time for his segment. Maybe next time, Dave. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. So remember, whatever happens here stays here. Oh, gee, I've got another movie. Man, we are with the movie passes. We are trading blows now, I feel like. And that's just going to continue. This uh, after show is probably going to be all movies all the time for the foreseeable future because we love giving you good reviews of good stuff that we see, unless we find something incredibly, incredibly funny. 
Uh, but this one was a movie I saw that stars one of my favorite actresses, Frances McDermott, and it's called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. What's the law on what you can and cannot say on a billboard? I assume you can't say nothing defamatory and you can't say f- f- that, right? Or anus? I think I'll be all right then. I guess you're Angela Hayes' mother. That's right. I'm Angela Hayes' mother. So, Mildred Hayes, why did you put up these billboards? My daughter Angela was murdered seven months ago. It seems to me the police department is too busy torturing black folks to solve actual crime. What the hell is this? Dixon, I'm in the middle of my god Easter dinner. Sorry, kids. I know, Chief, but I think we got kind of a problem. Sunshine beating on a good time. I'd do anything to catch your daughter's killer. I don't think those billboards is very fair. The time it took you to get out here whining like a b- Willoughby. Some other poor girl's probably out there being butchered right now. We've had two. And the investigation begins. Uh, this investigation that supposedly Woody Harrelson as uh, Chief Willoughby of the police department, according to Francis McDermott's character, he hasn't taken it seriously enough over the last several years. And so... Um, she puts up the billboards, and guess what happens then, OG? Then uh, kind of chaos ensues. People decide which team they're on. Are they on uh, Chief Willoughby's team? Are they on her team? You think at the beginning of this movie, because we have, clearly we have a murder, we have an angry uh, woman who's the mom character, and we have a chief of police. What do you think happens then? I'm guessing it, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> what do you think? They try to solve the murder, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought this was a trick question. No, no. Well, it is a trick question because the movie doesn't even go there. The movie, the movie oh. doesn't even really address the murder. It, it really dives into all of these people and their lives. Woody Harrelson's character, the chief, has cancer and it deals with him as who's a human being under fire from this other person. It has the mad mother and you kind of get into her head about why she's so angry about her. Obviously, with her daughter dying, that's a reason to be angry, but there's another reason she's angry. It deals with people in the town and how they they split their sides. And it deals with some of the sheriff's deputies in their life. In fact, one of the main people in the movie doesn't start off as a main person, but really ends up, a lot of the movie ends up being by him, this deputy played by Sam Rockwell. And by the way, OG, Sam Rockwell is one of these actors that I would say most people listening to the show probably don't know him as a household name. He's kind of like if we were talking about Tom Hardy five years ago, You'd say the name Tom Hardy, and if you'd seen his movies, you'd go, oh, yeah, that guy's really good. But he hadn't yet developed into a name brand. Maybe people don't even know Tom Hardy. I don't know. But um, but certainly Sam Rockwell's in that category where he plays a character I've never seen him play before and does it so excellently. So well-written story. Doesn't go the way you think that it would. Great characters. Well, well done. And, uh, and I really didn't like it. No. No, you know why? I just, not only did the movie not go where I wanted to go, I like, between the two of us, like, which one of us two is the plot-driven guy? Y- you? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love a good, no, I'm all about characters. You want to see stuff oh. blow up, right? You want to see stuff blow up. Blow up. Plot. Is, that what, is that what plot means? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to have a plot that goes somewhere. So if if you tell me about this movie, which is the reason I went to see it, I went, oh, yeah, this is totally me. Frances McDermott, you know, I love Fargo. I love almost everything she's been in. Great actress. Uh, Still fantastic. Woody Harrelson's probably better in this movie than any movie I've ever seen him in. So best supporting actor, you know, nomination here, I would think, for Woody Harrelson in this movie. The movie just doesn't go anywhere. I, I like seeing people change in movies. I like having something. I don't want to be beat over the head with a, this is what it's about, or this is what life's about. But I do want to see a character kind of learn a lesson, even if it's a subtle one. Hardly anybody learns anything in this movie. It just is... Kind of like our podcast. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What's the point of this podcast? That's going to be the review somebody puts up online. I'd listen to it if somebody changed. Something happened if they changed lives. So I got done, and I was depressed, And uh, just it spent two hours with these miserable, miserable people in this horrible situation. And I went, whoa, 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 what was the point? It was a story well told that I didn't really want to be involved with. So three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Uh, I'm giving it a thumbs down because I didn't like it. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you'll like it. It gets great reviews. I can see why it gets great reviews. 
it's well done. Not for me. All right, cool. And I would definitely say not for you. I'm glad you said that because I it was on my list. Was it really on your list? Yeah. Or was it on your list of movies to avoid? No, it's on my <laughs> list. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'd do it. All, All right. right. All right. More to come on Wednesday. Later.